All right, Grant, you're all sorted. We'll make a start. Morning, everybody. Hello to everyone in the room. My name is Lisa Hasker from Vicsport. Hello to everyone um, back in their offices or working from home. We've got a very large contingent online. So welcome. Um, thank you for coming and thank you very much to Landers and Rogers for hosting us today. And I'll introduce Simon, our speaker, in a minute. Can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're all meeting and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Um, we're going to talk integrity today. We're in the middle of our series of um, governance workshops and it's great to see so many familiar faces and some new faces to meet today, so welcome. And as I said, people online, um, please feel free to pop questions. If you're online, um, pop the questions in the chat and we will address those as we go through the session and where appropriate. Um, if you need, if you're in the room and you need to uh, leave the room for a phone call or for a um, a bathroom break, just wander out the back door whenever you need to and bathrooms are just along on the same side as the entrance. Um, and if you get lost, there's um, some wonderful staff at reception that will help you. If you need to leave the building, getting back in is a bit the same as when you came in. You have to go to the concierge and come up and get them to let you in the lift. So that's for security reasons. Um, but at home, just a reminder, any questions as you think of them, as you go through the presentation, pop them in the chat and we will address those as we go along. Um, our speaker today is Simon Merritt from Lander and Rogers. Uh, Simon's helped us with a couple of these presentations and is our go-to guru when we get um, a stumbling block with anything legal, governance or integrity. So it's wonderful to have Simon here today. He's um, he's flipped himself out of a boat on a holiday, so he's a bit sore, so be nice to him. Um, but welcome, Simon, and thank you so much for taking us through um, our session today on sport integrity. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Lisa, and um, to those online, welcome, and to everyone, uh, the hearty souls in the room. Thanks for uh, attending in person. It's always nice to see some faces uh, in the room. Uh, yes, as Lisa mentioned, I was actually on annual leave last week and um, cartwheeled a catamaran and managed to fracture my back. So that's the danger of going on holiday. Everyone should just uh, stay at work and uh, work forever. Um, today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, an ever increasing uh, topic within the sport industry, as I'm sure everyone in the room and online uh, is aware of uh, sport integrity and sport integrity policies. Um, this is an area where we get uh, consistent queries from all levels of the um, federated and non-federated sporting structures. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, integrity issues within the sporting environment are getting far more complex. The systems and processes that are put in place to manage and prevent integrity matters from escalating are, are getting more complex, convoluted and um, potentially difficult to interpret and apply. So a whole range of essentially unavoidable challenges that sports, uh, sport organisations are going through at the moment and probably will continue to go through as systems and processes evolve over the next 5, 10, 20 years. So it's, uh, it's a really prevalent topic and um, certainly one that we consistently advise our sport clients on on the day-to-day -day basis. Um, as we go through the presentation, feel free to ask questions at the relevant topics. Uh, no need to wait till the end, uh, particularly if there's anyone in the room, um, just chuck your hand up and Anthony uh, will hand the roving mic to you so the people online can uh, hear the question as well. Uh, and he'll be moderating the, the chat and uh, letting me know some questions as we go through. So keen for it to be as interactive as possible and feel free to try and get some free legal advice uh, along the way since you've made the effort to turn up this morning uh, and away we go. So it's a little bit of a summary of what we're going to talk about today. Um, apologies if some of the content in the first section uh, you're already across and, and already know well, but um, we certainly find it's always useful to just take a little bit of a step back and provide a higher level umbrella overview of where 
particularly for national integrity framework and non-NIF policies are at these days. Um, so we'll go through where the policies are at, uh, some recent changes to those documents and some interesting statistics and uh, some uh, tidbits and uh, comments that we've seen from particularly the last couple of years working with sport organisations at the different levels. Uh, and then the second half of the presentation will really be focused on how this applies to you uh, being directors, officers, senior staff members of sporting organisations. So, so a few dot points on the agenda uh, chrono chronologically as we're going through. So if you're just thinking about if you've got questions on any of those topics, um, feel free to raise them. And then the second half uh, really focused on how this applies to the people in the room. Uh, so importantly to start with um, is the dichotomy and the separation between these two fairly new organisations, Sport Integrity Australia and the National Sports Tribunal. Um, interestingly, you'll always see CR written as Sports Integrity Australia in the paper, which I might be a pedant, but always bugs me because it's Sport Integrity Australia. But uh, SIA is a government agency that essentially uh, was the old ASADA that then got a whole uh, new range of additional sport integrity functions through amended legisl Commonwealth legislation uh, a few years ago. So uh, SIA assumed all of ASADA's anti -doping, existing anti-doping functions and now also deals with a range of sport integrity functions that essentially flow through from various international treaties that the Commonwealth Government have signed up to, uh, and that's where SIA gets its jurisdiction on certain matters. And it's through SIA that uh, over the last couple of years, uh, it developed and has now rolled out the National Integrity Framework, which is a standardised suite of integrity policies that are adopted at the NSO level and cascade down through the Federated Sporting Organisations. Uh, so we'll touch on exactly what that is. National Sports Tribunal, entirely separate. Uh, it's a, a quasi sort of court slash statutory tribunal established under its own separate Commonwealth legislation. Uh, it's created um, based on some uh, similar bodies in other jurisdictions like the UK and New Zealand. Uh, it operates as a sports specific dispute resolution tribunal. Uh, it has in its legislation criteria for what types of matters it has jurisdiction over and what's excluded. Uh, so it got off to a little bit of a slow start because it was right through COVID when uh, sports uh, sort of went into hibernation, but uh, really probably over the past six to 12 months, we're starting to see a lot more cases go to arbitration through the tribunal. Uh, and they've got a good website that has a lot of resources, including uh, decision summaries for the, the different types of arbitrations that have been held, which range from, at the moment, a lot of selection disputes, but uh, similarly, a lot of disciplinary matters. Uh, and there's a direct uh, feed into the National Integrity Framework that I'll touch on where uh, respondents can challenge a breach finding or a sanction through the NST. Where there's some complexities out of the NST's creation is uh, as part of its uh, work to upskill the sporting sector and in conjunction with SIA and the Australian Sports Commission, uh, I think they recognised that whilst the National Integrity Framework provided a standard suite of policies for the relevant matters that those policies addressed, there's a whole range of other behavioural issues that sport organisations commonly dealt with, uh, with and against and through their membership. Uh, things like social media and code of conduct type issues most prevalently and sports had really been left to their own devices to determine uh, how they dealt with those matters under their own policies which were very disparate and uh, changed depending on what sport it was and often within sports uh, there would be different policies applying at the different levels. So what the NST has done is it's prepared a range of template policies that have some similarities to the NIF, but uh, deal with and are 
uh, targeted at non-national integrity framework matters. So they've got a template conduct and disciplinary policy, which I know many NSOs have adopted. And in the same way that the national integrity framework operates, that policy is intended to cascade down from the NSO to the SSOs, the associations, clubs and individual participants in the sport. So in that manner, there's a range of sports that now have a sort of dual uh, policy process that applies all the way down. National integrity framework matters on the one hand, non-national integrity framework matters on the other with a sort of standardised approach. And we're certainly seeing more and more NSOs and therefore uh, the entire sport uh, operate in that context. Uh, so we'll sort of reference NIF and non-NIF policies in this presentation. Apologies uh, for a lot of acronyms. Uh, there's not really any way of getting around it when you deal with this content on a day-to-day on a -day basis, but if anyone has any questions about that, let me know. So what is the National Integrity Framework? Hopefully this is uh, not news to many, if any, in the room. Uh, it's a set of five policies that deal with a range of the uh, core sport integrity topics. So, and many of these are areas that uh, would be well known to everyone uh, from historic previous versions. So you've got the MPP, Child Safeguarding Policy, uh, your sort of sports science-y type uh, content, which is now the improper use of drugs and medicine policy, uh, and match fixing, which is the uh, competition, manipulation and sport wagering policy. Um, so those are essentially the forward facing policies that uh, prohibit certain conduct in each of those areas. So in the same way that the old MPP that was uh, prepared by the Sports Commission and applied to sports uh, prescribed or proscribed various uh, conduct. Um, those four outer policies uh, do it in the same way, where they have defined prohibited conduct um, in, the, in that same manner. Uh, and then sort of applying to each of those is the complaints, disputes and discipline policy, so the CDDP. And what that policy does is it is the one-stop shop for then determining how alleged breaches of the NIF are dealt with. So the MPP will say what's prohibited, but it will then say if there's an allegation, so a complaint or a report in relation to an alleged breach, you then go to the CDDP and that sets out how you deal with it from the time that uh, there's been a, a complaint or report to closure of the matter. Uh, so in that manner, the CDDP contains a combination of both sort of procedural requirements around the actual process from when a complaint comes in, what, what are next steps, what are the mechanisms we can use to deal with it. Uh, and then it also has some obligations that it imposes on the various entities that are captured. So things like appointing a complaints manager, for instance, which is a, a go-to uh, point in the sport that has that person has certain functions under the policy. Um, it has flow down obligations for SSOs uh, and others bound by the policy to adopt and implement it and to educate people. Um, so it's it's a sort of procedural document and it has some other obligations that are um, directly related to that type of content. So a couple of the critical points on the slides. It's a Sport Integrity Australia document. It was uh, created by CR and the whole NIF uh, ecosystem is administered by CR. Uh, if, like with all policies, if it's adopted by an NSO and in the form that uh, CR has prepared them in, if it's adopted by an NSO, it's uh, automatically taken to apply to the SSOs in particular. Uh, the basis for that is the standard contractual jurisdiction that arises when an SSO is a member of the NSO. The constitution creates a contract between them. There's generally a clause in the constitution that says the sport, the NSO can make policies that have the same force as the constitution. So the NIF as a policy of the NSO then applies to the SSO um, and there's various adoption uh, provisions in the CDDP that I mentioned. 
Uh, and then this third point that we'll touch on in a couple of later slides, there's uh, certain conduct that may be in, in breach of the sports rules, or you may want there it to be in breach of the rules, uh, but it won't be covered by the NIF. So um, there's alternative mechanisms that you'll need to adopt. So touching on those non-NIF policies, the most prevalent one is the conduct and disciplinary policy that the NST uh, provides a template for and a, a range of NSOs have adopted. Uh, so there's going to be, for all the sports that have now adopted the NIF, which is basically everyone other than the professional sports, and we'll, we'll touch on that in a minute, uh, there's now going to be uh, a separation between NIF conduct and non-NIF conduct. So if there's one thing to think about at the initial stages of any kind of complaint or report or informal allegations arising within your sport, one of the first things that should be triggered is, is this conduct that's going to be covered by the NIF or it's not? And the NIF policies um, are pretty easy to remember, at least the, the headings or overarching uh, subject content of those. So that's going to be a bit of a giveaway, whether it's likely to be NIF content. The member protection policy essentially covers most of the previous MPP matters. Child safeguarding is broadly anything to do with uh, children or young people under the age of 18. Uh, there's sports science, sports medicine covered by the uh, improper use of uh, drugs policy. And then anything in the match fixing realm is, is dealt with by that. So that first step is critical because, as we'll touch on in the second half, one of the uh, big legal issues that arises is uh, incorrectly determining what policy or procedure of a sport applies. And, and this gets particularly complex when you start getting to the SSO level rather than NSO because you've then got a scenario where there's flow down obligations under a cascading policy you as an SSO will have your own separate policies for certain subject matter. You'll potentially have a cascading down non-NIF policy from the NSO. You might have a constitutional clause that prescribes certain matters. Uh, so it can be quite a complex uh, ecosystem. So the first step is, is it NIF or non-NIF? Because that can be um, a really fundamental issue if that uh, is interpreted incorrectly. Uh, and then you get, for, particularly for non-NIF matters, uh, you'll then need to ascertain where in your framework the relevant allegations sit. So generally speaking, for NIF and non-NIF NSO policies, because they cascade down, the SSO and its members will often be, or mostly be automatically bound by the policy. That can create a whole range of challenges when there's tension between the organisations around, uh, particularly for non-NIF uh, policies where there's not so much a binding fu funding obligation that's tied to adopting those policies in their exact format. Uh, there can absolutely be healthy tensions between different entities within the sport about uh, the applicable processes that should be adopted. Uh, there can be challenges around what an SSO and those lower down in the federated model actually have to do from an adoption and implementation perspective and whether NSO uh, implementing the policy is sufficient or whether the SSO actually has to take further steps to itself adopt it. Uh, what it then has to do to ensure that its associations and clubs are bound and as a first step are aware of the policy and what their requirements are and where someone needs to go if they have a complaint about behaviour uh, and the legal risks that arise from that. Unfortunately, some of those questions are very sport specific because it will turn on the wording in your constitution for the NSO and the SSO, historical practice, what the NSO is asking the SSO to do, um, the SSO's internal governance processes and how it itself adopts policies. So uh, it's pretty bespoke uh, from a sport to sport basis. Question. Sorry, just before we, can we get you to ask the question at the microphone so that everyone can hear us online. 
Um, yeah, sorry, I was just wondering if an NSO hasn't developed some policies, is it okay for the SSO to start implementing their own or do we always have to wait till they come through from the national body? No, certainly, certainly you, you wouldn't be required to wait for an NSO policy, generally speaking, for, for different subject matter. Um, there will be, particularly because the Sports Commission is now a lot more prescriptive in its funding agreements with NSOs around what their compliance obligations are. Generally, you can be pretty confident, if it's a funded NSO, that it has policies in place that meet all the compliance requirements and that they flow down. And if they don't have something in a particular area, then yes, you would you are a separate entity, so you would be absolutely uh, entitled to have your own policies covering that subject area. Probably gets a little bit more murky if it's a non-funded NSO because they're, they aren't necessarily subject to the same requirements. So they might not have policies in some areas that funded NSOs do. Um, and so you can potentially risk crossover and inconsistencies and issues arising where two different people will have a different view on how the same matter gets dealt with. So uh, probably some uh, practical tips would be actually first ascertaining whether the NSO has a policy in that area and whether it cascades down to, to the SSO and applies. Um, and that can always be a, a two-edged sword because you may you may want to, as the SSO, have your own policy and not want the NSO to be dealing in that area. So there's a little bit of stakeholder relationship and, and management issue at play there. Um, but first step would be ascertaining whether they do have a policy in, in whatever means is the usual for that, that sport. And then secondly, determining to what extent does the SSO want to play in that space. Thank you. Uh, so mainly this content in there for the slides. Uh, so we'll, we'll share the slides through VicSport with everyone post the session. So uh, mainly in here for a refresher for you, uh, those couple of dot points there uh, at the end of the complaints, disputes and discipline policy, those, those other separate non-procedural requirements that I mentioned where there is some um, uh, obligation on entities bound within the sport to take certain steps as opposed to just the procedure for dealing with a complaint. So the first NSOs to adopt the NIF occurred uh, on 1 Jan 2022. Uh, there was a pretty fundamental change uh, that occurred in early 2023 in relation to the entirety of the national integrity framework uh, and probably didn't necessarily filter down to SSOs in as clear um, and concise manner as it should and certainly uh, in our experience anything below SSOs we're, we're probably not aware of the change necessarily which is a bit problematic um, and we'll touch on it later in the presentation but uh, in the original version of the NIF SIA's responsibility was to handle all complaints alleging breaches of the NIF so any of those four uh, member facing policies if there was a complaint uh, about an alleged breach, it would go to CR and it would take certain steps to, to deal with it and then send it back to the sport once a decision had been made. So uh, due to a couple of jurisdictional issues that apparently arose at CR, there was a fundamental change early last year where uh, CR only has legal jurisdiction to deal with two types of matters, child safeguarding and discrimination. So that in, in short, um, that is due to uh, SIA's jurisdiction arising from Australia signing those international conventions and the flow through on what those conventions uh, actually cover. But in short, of all the NIF policies, um, the only alleged breaches that are now handled by SIA are breaches of the child safeguarding policy and under the MPP, allegations of discrimination. Um, which itself can be quite problematic because generally an MPP matter will have allegations of any number of breaches across discrimination, potentially victimisation, harassment, etc. But 
in short, those two matters are still dealt by dealt with by SIA. All other breaches of the NIF are now dealt with uh, internally by the sport. So that will be, generally speaking, initially the NSO, uh, but then further to these changes that uh, were brought in last year, the CDDP now allows or is clearer in allowing the NSO to refer matters down the federated chain to the correct or most appropriate level of the sport that the allegations relate to. So you don't have um, somewhat perverse scenarios where something that's clearly a club matter where it's occurred in the club environment between two club members uh, would be dealt with by the NSO. So in that scenario, child safeguarding and discrimination are handled by SEA in the sense that they investigate and they make a determination of whether the allegations are substantiated or not, and then a recommended sanction under the case categorisation model, and they send it to the sport to actually decide the sanction and then notify the respondent. For all the other matters, uh, it will be the sport's responsibility to work out whether the allegation is substantiated or not, and then also the, the sanction. In doing that, they can absolutely still use the case categorisation model uh, that's built into the NIF, but essentially it becomes the sport's responsibility to undertake the investigation to determine whether um, there's any veracity to the allegations. Another of the relevant changes in this batch was the NIF has opened up the possibility of other policies of the sport being administered through the CDDP. So in its first iteration, it was only the NIF policies that were dealt with by that CDDP. Uh, under the new model, there's a discretionary ability for a sport to build in breaches of other policies to be dealt with by the, the CDDP as well. And they give, the most common example that they give is, so it gives is code of conduct. So generally a sport will have an overarching code or any number of codes that apply to different sectors within the organisation. Um, that's a common suggestion that SEA has to build into the CDDP. Uh, it's discretionary, so sports don't have to do it, unlike the other NIF policies where it's mandatory. Uh, and it's sort of yet to be seen whether sports will take up that option to a great extent or lesser extent. So, from our experience, a couple of the fundamental issues that come out of these changes are the MPP issue of some breaches being within and without or outside CS jurisdiction can be quite problematic, um, particularly where there needs to be a determination of what elements of allegations will be dealt with by SEA and what come back to the sport putting aside the fact that they generally come from the exact same incident or incidents. So it can become, um, it can lead to a lot of duplication, confusion, uh, the possibility of doubling up. Um, so unfortunately, there's not really any way around that that we can see other than sports being um, very upfront in liaising with SEA about which components they will be dealing with and what the sport needs to itself deal with. Uh, and timeliness uh, and the length of time it takes for matters to be investigated and determined whether they're substantiated is a bit of an ongoing problem that we've seen. Uh, certainly, even for matters that are probably relatively straightforward uh, and confined from a factual basis and may have uh, the complainant and respondent and maybe a small number of witnesses to certain of ongoing conduct. Uh, we're certainly finding that uh, it can take a significant amount of time for SEA to investigate and make a determination. Uh, we've certainly seen in some instances uh, up, up to and upwards of a year for a matter. So um, it's something to be aware of and plan for as sports because unfortunately it's not within your control but the reality is the sport is the one that often faces the brunt of the member feedback complaint uh, questioning so it's something that 
uh, you need to be aware of and need to sort of have a formulated plan for uh, dealing with. And this, that's where education and upskilling the whole sporting cohort comes in handy because uh, it's a lot easier to have those conversations if people are broadly aware that it's SIA determining those matters rather than the sport. Uh, so some other comments on uh, recent information that's been released. Uh, of the alleged breaches, 95% uh, of them are MPP and child safety related. So that's probably uh, to be expected. The other couple of integrity policies are very much more aimed at probably high performance and the elite side of the sport. And in reality, it's a lot more difficult to uh, determine match fixing and similar obligations at the lower levels. It's completely underreported compared to the professional side of things for a number of reasons. And similarly, you probably don't, you simply just don't get as much uh, support personnel um, and related people like physios, sports scientists, et cetera, at the participation and grassroots level compared to uh, high performance. So CIA released some information from the last 12 months, which was uh, early May, so 12 months back from that, uh, 238 complaints, so pretty high proportion child safeguarding, probably as to be expected when it's just safeguarding and discrimination. Uh, of those, 197 safeguarding, 37 substantiated, uh, and 52 managed by education. So that's sort of giving you some number of or proportion of where complaints are going. One comment that we've uh, certainly as a firm have seen uh, now that there's a lot more or starting to be a lot more jurisprudence and NST decisions. Uh, so under the NIF, you can challenge a respondent if they're sanctioned, can challenge that in the National Sports Tribunal, either the actual breach itself or the sanction or both. Uh, and pretty, pretty much every decision that we see, the NST, even if it upholds the sanction or, or breach will reduce the severity of the sanction. Uh, so it's something for sports to keep in mind that the, the cold hard reality is uh, NST matters will generally reduce a sanction even if they uphold the breach. Um, certainly in some cases we would say um, disproportionately reduce uh, based on the, the facts of matters, um, but that's, that's certainly a comment that we've seen in part, that's because there's such a diverse range of NST members. I think the list is probably 50 or so long of people that are eligible to hear matters in the NST. So there's a, a lot of uh, diversity in the range of uh, people, particularly their professional background. Whilst there's lawyers and barristers, there's a whole range of non-legal people that can hear matters as well. So um, something to keep in mind. Um, and then sort of linking in with the timeliness point as well, there can be a little bit at times of a vacuum of information sharing or lack of information sharing between SIA and a sport, which in our experience can often be rectified through the sport proactively reaching out and asking questions. So uh, SIA is generally uh, good to engage with when the sport is proactive and asks questions and, and they will generally give you pretty direct answers to the questions you frame. But uh, something to, for sports to keep in mind is that they see it won't necessarily be reaching out with that information without a prompt from the sport. So essentially, if, if you don't know the status of something that's with SIA and, and you want to know, just directly reach out. So a snapshot of the industry and where everyone is at. There's 91 NSOs that now have signed up to the full NIF in its uh, substantive form. So the, the first adopters were July 22. The most recent, there was three or four that uh, adopted one Jan this year. And then for the sports that are out, uh, they, as part of their own funding obligations, still have uh, similar compliance obligations around ensuring their integrity policies in the same areas uh, essentially meet minimum standards uh, that 
sort of transverse the same broad requirements of the NIF. Uh, so this is CIA's latest uh, public facing document around compliance. I'm not sure how accurate it is or whether there's been further updates from when it was published, but um, that gives you a list of the sports that um, have their own integrity framework, mostly professional sports that have sort of significantly more resources than the Olympic NSOs and then other unfunded NSOs. Uh, generally speaking, they're not fundamentally that different because to meet the standards, you still have to essentially deal with the same subject matter and topic areas. So uh, there, there was, there's some distinctions in the procedural aspects, uh, particularly because some of the organisations aren't standard federated structures. So uh, there's a little bit of uh, difference between those organisations, but some of them have uh, policies that are quite similar to the NIF. Another recent change, uh, new case categorization model was brought in by SIA quite recently. Uh, it doesn't fundamentally change the three level system that was previously in place, but uh, it tweaks the descriptions. Uh, so something to be aware of. And this also gives you a bit of background as to when SIA is investigating a matter and if it finds there's been a breach and recommends a sanction, it will apply this case categorization model. And if you look into the document, which I think is about seven or eight pages, it then gives some example sanctions for each of the categories. So if you flick through that document, that gives you some idea of the recommendations for the different tiers. Uh, and this is something that NSOs, SSOs and the like can similarly uh, utilised when it, they are determining uh, sanctions for breaches. Uh, so this is really in there just for your background for if you read the slides. Um, unfortunately, it looks quite complex uh, when you put it down on paper and the reality is it, it can be uh, somewhat complex. One of the downsides of the Australian Federated Sporting Structure is to have a policy that sort of purportedly applies from the NSO down uh, means it's quite difficult to have a very simple, straightforward document. And there's a whole range of inherent requirements, particularly around determining what level of the sport a matter is dealt with, uh, have to be contained in there. Um, so unfortunately, the CDDP is not a two page uh, document that you can easily uh, pick up, read and interpret. Um, SIA does have some good resources on its website that simplify the process and have uh, some flowcharts and uh, sort of FAQs, um, which I highly recommend sports utilise because uh, even for lawyers who don't practice in the sporting space, it can be somewhat challenging to pick up the CDDP and just work out how to apply it. Uh, but in short, a couple of the fundamental concepts in the NIF are complaints and reports. So if there's an alleged breach of any of those policies, uh, you can make a complaint, which is uh, someone who actually submits the allegations uh, and puts their name and contact details to them. They don't have to be the victim. They can simply be someone who uh, has seen the conduct or witnessed it, or it might be secondhand that they have heard about it. But under the CDDP, a complaint is where there's someone that essentially stands behind the, the um, lodgement of the information. Different concept is a report, which is done anonymously through either the uh, SIA hotline or directly to the sport, but generally to, to SIA who have a, a particular hotline for specifically for anonymous reports. Um, it can be challenging for SIA or the sport to deal with reports because to ensure procedural fairness is granted, it can be limiting as to what the sport can do and a report might result in there being insufficient information to be able to sort of lawfully take further steps, but under the NIF, there's a requirement that all reports are dealt with to the extent they can be, and then even if there's no further action filed, and certainly something that we're seeing more so is 
incidents where there's allegations against a respondent where there might have been a report involving them previously. So that starts to give rise to patterns of behaviour. Uh, investigation is obviously a critical concept in the NIF to determine whether to the re requisite standard the allegations are substantiated or not. You then move into if they are, uh, CEO will provide a recommended sanction for matters within its jurisdiction or otherwise the sport comes up with the uh, entirety of the sanction. Importantly, in the in the former, the sport still actually decides the sanction, but um, most of the time it will just adopt the CEO recommendation. Sport sends the breach notice to the respondent. They have the ability to challenge that. They can go to the NST if it's an NST eligible matter, which most of them under the NIF are, uh, and then you go to a uh, NST hearing if, if so. Uh, and taking into account our comment that probably seven or eight times out of 10, uh, a sanction will get reduced even if upheld by the NST. Uh, again, this is the this looks quite complex. Um, it's the flowchart for dealing with matters under the non-NIF conduct and disciplinary policy. So, for those NSOs that have adopted that separate cascading policy for non-NIF matters, it looks more complex mainly because there's a few different or additional avenues that sports can use to deal with matters. Uh, so there's a minor breach procedure. Um, there's breach offer, which is sort of the same as breach notice, alternative dispute resolution. It operates predominantly in the same way as the NIF from a procedural perspective. Uh, and again, it is set up so that it's aimed at the relevant or the most appropriate or relevant level of the sport deals with a matter. So again, even if something goes to the NSO, it will refer it down the federated chain to an SSO or an association, for instance, if it's more appropriately dealt with there. So again, this is some good background for the slides uh, that you can take home. Critical point, working out which framework you're operating under to start with, because if, if that's sort of done incorrectly at the start, then that can lead to some fairly catastrophic issues around the validity of uh, the process and sanction. Uh, and there's probably nothing worse than a sport having gone through a proper process under the relevant rules, uh, only to ascertain that it wasn't the correct policy to have applied. And therefore you might have to redo the whole process if the respondent has legal advice, for instance. So chucked up a couple of case studies here. Uh, I'll let everyone in the room or online have a read. Is anyone sufficiently brave to have a crack at thinking from their sports perspective what they would do? Any, anyone having a crack? I have to say, Lisa, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. So it should be front of mind for everyone. Are you are you dealing with a matter that's dealt with under the NIF or not? Because if it is NIF, then there'll be a designated procedure that you can follow and it'll uh, predominantly be uh, from a decision making perspective where which level of the sport it is. So the first first case study, so you're dealing with a 14 year old as a potential respondent slash victim. So that's an immediate trigger child safeguarding policy. So the breadth of that policy will generally cover most, if not everything, where there is a respondent 
uh, that's under 18 years of age. So those are two really quick triggers um, for whatever role you have in a sport. If you hear allegations and it's to do with an under 18, then there's a there's a very high likelihood that it'll be child safeguarding policy under the NIF. So if we played this out, how this would be dealt with, uh, it's at a state championship, so could be potentially state or national level, but because it's a child safeguarding matter, it's within SEA's jurisdiction. So the allegations can either be submitted directly to SEA or they can go to the sport who would then refer it to SEA. So either way, it, it ultimately goes to SEA to take the initial steps under the NIF procedure. Um, I think we find mostly these days child safeguarding stuff goes directly to SEA. Everyone is very comfortable referring uh, matters directly there. Um, complainants are willing to use their the hotline or the reporting mechanism available. So SEA will take the information. It'll undergo an initial assessment as to whether it likely falls within the, the NIF of the relevant sport. It's not any of the excluded matters like a whistleblower uh, matter or a personal grievance or any of the other minor exclusions. Once it gets over that hurdle, it will start investigating the matter and the alleged breach. Uh, so that will involve taking statements from generally the uh, respondent and the complainant. And if the complainant's not um, the victim, then potentially the victim as well. There's witnesses. The uh, CR investigator will uh, interview witnesses. Um, and then CR creates quite a uh, substantial report off the back of all that investigation done by the CR staff member um, that ultimately spits out whether the allegation is substantiated or not substantiated. Uh, it, if it's substantiated, it moves it through the case categorization model and comes up with a recommended sanction, sends it back to the sport. Uh, the sport then reviews all the information, prepares the breach notice using the template and determines the sanction taking into account CS recommendation. So the sport itself will actually send the breach notice even for those matters within CS jurisdiction rather than CIA itself. Uh, a couple of questions. Question from the floor. Thank you. Um, back at the start, you were talking about difference between NIF and non-NIF and which way they would go. And you'd mentioned about social media being non-NIF and sitting with the tribunal. So what happens here because they posted on social media, but does it go back to the initial issue, which was the child safety issue? Uh, for the second point? For yeah. The second, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this one, it's it, absolutely right that the forum in which comments are made, for instance, doesn't necessarily determine which of NIF and non-NIF. It will be actually what ultimately when push comes to shove, what alleged breach of a particular policy has occurred. In this one, it's probably, on, on balance, it would be more likely that it doesn't fit within the NIF because you could say it may constitute abuse, but it probably wouldn't uh, get to that level. It's, it's more like, um, and it would be defamatory statements in under civil law, um, but that's not, uh, defamatory comments are not specifically dealt with and prohibited under the NIF. So on this one, it would uh, most likely fall outside the NIF for a sport. And then you would look at for this type of defamatory type conduct or comments, what, if any, of the relevant other policies, non-NIF policies of the sport could apply. Um, so if you're talking about um, defamatory type conduct, which we see really frequently. Uh, the two go-tos for that would be code of conduct and whether there's some general wording that might capture this type of comment, bringing the sport into disrepute, those types of things. Um, 
separately, there's generally going to be a social media policy for the sport as well. And often we'll find that social media policies have specific wording in there around defamatory comments, um, which would be a very easy way that you could uh, apply a relevant section of a policy to say this person's probably breached. So for this one, we would say um, probably not NIF conduct because it probably doesn't reach the level of abuse or harassment necessarily if it was a single post, um, but it is probably defamatory. So is there uh, some other avenue that the sport could deal with it under? All right, we had a couple of questions from the floor. Let's get this one first. Um, in relation to complaints, um, and it's probably a bit more around case study one, uh, we got advised, Apollo Victoria, we got advised that if it is a child safeguarding matter in relation to actual competition, so it's occurring in the pool, it isn't covered by the NIF. The challenge we have is when we're talking about inappropriate contact, adults to a child, how do we manage that? Like, that's a challenge for us as a sport. We tell them to refer it to SIA. A month later, we get an email back saying, it's not under their purview. And then we've got to start from scratch four weeks later. And yeah. in the interim, these athletes have still been playing, um, you know, irrespective of the allegation is um, confirmed or not. Yeah, it's a really challenging one when you get incidents occurring field of play or very close to field of play uh, because there's an overlap between is it competition rules that apply, is it also NIF, if both apply, how do you work out which one applies? I think the, I think the cold hard reality is if, if that's been Sia's approach previously, then I think you just have to assume that that's going to be the case moving forward and therefore you would have to deal with it under your competition rules and that might mean the competition rules need updating to facilitate uh, bringing in by incorporation so you don't have to rewrite all of it some other requirements and prohibited conduct for instance um, as a workaround um, it's it's not ideal that there's these types of scenarios where what you would think applies doesn't actually apply. But um, in the sporting context, when there's a whole range of different rules that apply in different scenarios, it's somewhat unavoidable. So I think our practical advice would be you'd have to just assume that that's going to be the case moving forward. They're not suddenly going to change their view and you're in a difficult spot because if there's there's not really any easy way to challenge that determination by CR. So you, you're going to have to ensure that the competition rules as a sport sufficiently cover that type of conduct moving forward. And again, it's very difficult because you don't know what you don't know. So most of the time, if an incident arises and it's not covered, it's only then that you work out, here's a gap that we need to address. So you can certainly look at what's already in the NIF safeguarding policy and look at the themes, look at those types of matters and certainly with some crafty drafting you can even say that something that would breach the NIF outside the pool if it occurs within the pool the NIF wording and prohibited conduct applies but it's procedurally dealt with under your competition rules. Yeah, there's another question from the floor. Thank you Simon. Um, just wondering in that last one it's saying that uh, is to pay the judge and that's how he won last year, what would be the obligation regarding uh, investigating that for match fixing, I guess, is the allegation? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And you could probably, um, you could probably initially send it through the NIF on that side of things. If, there, if you had some form of sort of credible basis for thinking that there was the possibility and therefore it was worth in or needed to be investigated then you certainly could if I think on balance if there was no other extraneous evidence that supported a finding or likely inference that uh, there was any truth to that then you probably wouldn't need to deal with it under the NIF um, but on the basis that um, the match fixing policy under the NIF sits with the sport anyway, you get to a stage where if you are simply investigating a matter and it looks like then it needs to be changed, the channel that it's being dealt with needs to be changed, then 
there's not really any fundamental issue if it's at that stage. It's only once you get to a finding and sanction stage that it becomes problematic as to uh, which policy you've applied. Um, and certainly we would not, on if, if a client came to us with, with that issue, we would, we would certainly be telling them that unless there was something more that gave rise to some form of legitimate suspicion of possible corrupt, corrupt conduct, it probably wouldn't go through the NIF. Uh, as I mentioned, a couple of the other uh, non-NIF templates that the NST has uh, put out to the sporting landscape, these are not as commonly adopted by sporting organisations, uh, and certainly there's significant um, pros and cons about using these policies if a, if a particular sport is. Uh, so something just to be aware of that the NSO may or may not have adopted these. Um, those template policies are available on the NST website if you just want to have a look at how they operate. Uh, so from an SSO perspective, if you get to a point where you think you're sufficiently understanding the integrity policy environment, here's some next steps that you can, from a purely SSO perspective, look to determine, um, particularly if your SSO hasn't done a recent audit of its existing policies after your sports adoption of the NIF, you may well find that there's a whole lot of redundant content now. And that's certainly a process that we went through with a number of clients over the last couple of years. Once the NIF's adopted, you'll find that there may be existing policies that cover identical or very similar in certain sections subject matter and you certainly want to avoid a scenario where you've got multiple policies that deal with the same subject matter so certainly worth uh, from an SSO perspective doing a bit of an audit and work out of your historical policies are they all still necessary and relevant and have any been superseded either entirely or partially by a NIF policy and here's some examples that we've done in that space. So again, in the slides to just give you a couple of prompts on some of the more common scenarios where you might have existing policies that are still sitting there, but don't really have any further application in the current environment. Uh, so moving on to the next section of the presentation and how does it apply to you as directors, officers, senior managers of sporting organisations? So once you've actually got the catalogue of what you have in place, what you don't need anymore, and from a national policy perspective, what are you needing to comply with? And have you actually even got to the point of sufficiently adopting it properly? Because you may find that as an SSO, you're not complying with your obligations under that policy if you haven't taken a further step of actively adopting it yourself as an SSO board uh, or as a delegated policy of the SSO for by the CEO or, or whatnot. So that will feed into your uh, normal process and procedure around policy adoption. Generally, uh, there'll be a prescribed process. It might be up to the board level. CEO might have delegation to be able to do that. What steps do you need to take to liaise with the NSO about it? Uh, we certainly find there are some, there is some ability to get improvements to relevant policies through genuine feedback and discussions from the state to national level, and that can be a really positive thing because often the NSOs will be dealing with such a small subset of complaints and generally within their high performance teams that dealing with those types of complaints is very different to what an SSO has to deal with where you essentially become the sort of body of last resort for any and all complaints that have come from grassroots participation other regional levels up to you they may have been handled well and the respondents just not happy, or they may have been sort of fund fundamentally mismanaged along the process. So what you 
uh, as organisations are dealing with are uh, probably a lot different to what NSOs are normally dealing with. So there is the ability for SSOs to provide really crucial feedback. And for the non-NIF policies, where there's a lot more discretion around process, procedure, steps to take. Uh, so if your NSO has adopted the conduct and discipline policy from the NST, then that's one where we find existing sport po uh, processes that work really well can be uh, enhanced, introduced uh, into that policy. And there's no point reinventing the wheel or trying to replace a procedure that's working well in your sport and that's well understood uh, for no real reason. So that's more NSO facing as the SSO. And then if you're looking down to how you interact with your associations, clubs and your individual members, you'd be then looking at what are your standard processes for ensuring that there's the sufficient binding flow down of those policies, how are new policies and updates to existing policies communicated, what's your process for getting that information out there. Again, it's quite dependent on the membership structure of the organisation and your clubs, for instance, some sports, they'll be members of the NSO as well, some the clubs, associations won't be, they'll only be a member of you, the SSO. So working out the membership category structure and what you need to do to ensure that both the NIF and your non-NIF conduct policies, particularly if they're NSO cascading down, apply and are binding on your clubs and whatnot, because uh, certainly the, the thing that you most don't want uh, when an issue arises is a respondent taking a jurisdictional point on a matter and challenging on the basis that you they, they're not bound by a policy, the, the sport can't take action against them. Um, that's probably, in our experience, that's one of the key ways to uh, really have stakeholder issues. If complainants and their supporters come to you in good faith with legitimate complaints about alleged breaches of the rules, uh, no one's going to be particularly happy if there's a jurisdictional issue that means they can't be dealt with or a respondent who's sanctioned uh, ultimately gets off or avoids that sanction. So some of the legal considerations, which is obviously highly relevant to the work that we do and some of the conversations that we have with clients on a day-to-day -day basis in this area. Uh, this first one uh, relates to a very common question. So almost all sporting organisations will have existing disciplinary procedures at a very generic level. So uh, whether it's in the constitution or a delegated policy that says uh, if the board uh, thinks that someone has breached the constitution or the policies or has acted in a manner unbecoming, brought the sport into disrepute, then sport may refer the allegations to XYZ, which might be a tribunal, it might be the board, et cetera. So in, in particular in Victoria for incorporated associations, that disciplinary procedure actually has to be in the constitution uh, in a prescriptive manner. So you can't delegate to a policy. So for all the IA, SSOs, and then generally for most of your clubs, that'll all be in their constitution. Uh, and one of the one of the most common questions we get asked is the interaction between those types of clauses and the NIF conduct and disciplinary policy, et cetera. Generally speaking, uh, and put a caveat on, put my my uh, pure legal lawyer's hat on. Generally speaking, those clauses are drafted in a way that aren't exhaustive, so they can, from our perspective, sit entirely comfortably side by side with your sport adopting the NIF as an SSO under your NSO contractual obligations. So it's not something where, unless there was some very odd wording that is not common amongst the industry, those types of uh, generic clauses can entirely remain in your document in the current form uh, and don't need to be changed to facilitate adoption of the NIF. Really the only caveat to that would be if there was some odd language that sort of purported that any and all 
of those types of matters have to be dealt with exclusively by that clause to the exclusion of any other process. That would be the only scenario where you'd potentially get into trouble and probably need to have some tweaks. But uh, in sort of my 11 years of working here, I don't think I've come across a policy, uh, a clause that is drafted in that manner because that would essentially preclude you as an SSO from having any other policies yourself. So it, it wouldn't be, there'd be no utility in having such wording anyway. So first point is generally won't have to uh, update your very high level constitutional or existing disciplinary clause. Uh, if you have separate policies that are your general disciplinary regs, what we find it can be beneficial is updating them to really clearly set out that if it's a NIF matter, it's dealt with over there under the NIF, um, just for the avoidance of doubt and to avoid any uh, confusion because often, particularly at the grassroots level and club land, if they've gone through a process before, um, they might, with good intentions, but mistakenly nonetheless, think that that uh, policy or approach applies the, the second time when it should be the NIF. So, um, something, just a one sentence, can be really beneficial from that side of things. Uh, so that flows into the second point. Uh, going back to the policy audit uh, point that I previously made, that's going to be crucial uh, to ensure that there's no duplication, there's no inconsistencies between uh, fundamental national policies and your own policies. So getting the balance right of um, what the disciplinary procedure is for different policies and where they go and how that's documented is uh, fundamental because you need to ensure that whatever the conduct, uh, everyone is broadly clear, even if it takes reading the policy, uh, as to how you, what procedure you apply and what you follow. And certainly touching on that competition rules point, that's another common one we see because generally there'll be incidents that arise on the field that could be potentially a breach of another policy in another context. So it's really useful for the sport to know sort of clearly and upfront if someone abuses someone or uses vilification or vilifies someone or whatnot on the field, is that competition rules or is that outside uh, under another policy? So from a worst case scenario, uh, legally speaking, um, the, the most common ones using the wrong policy, uh, that can essentially mean that the entire sanction is invalidated and you have to start again. And generally our advice would be, if it's very clear that another policy and procedure should have been used, uh, probably nine, nine to 10 times out of 10 if a respondent challenge that all the way to the civil courts, then they'd get the sanctions set aside and ordered a rehearing. So that, that can be uh, critical, particularly if you're talking about serious offences and scenarios where you are suspending for a long period or expelling individuals from the sport at the very serious end, uh, then that can be a pretty fundamentally uh, negative outcome. And similarly, misapplication of the correct policy can have the same consequence. So generally the courts, to, to the extent that this ever, these matters ever get to the civil courts, which is rare but not unheard of, the remedy if the applicant is successful is the decision is set aside and it's sent back to the sport for a redetermination, often with directions from the court around here's the deficiencies and here's what you actually have to do. It's rare that they will, a court will say you're barred from rehearing the matter, but it's again not unheard of for a court to make that decision, particularly if it's been a lengthy suspension, for instance, and the respondent only uh, challenges it and it gets through the courts a year or two years after the, the date, by which point the court might say they've served their sanction and you can't go back and reissue it. So some fundamental uh, legal issues to consider if you're uh, working through what you need to apply or not. 
historical documents are becoming even more critically important nowadays uh, due to the fact that there's been so much policy change across the industry and obviously 1 Jan 22 was the high water mark with mo a lot of the sports adopting the NIF at that point to ensure that uh, sort of contractual laws are complied with and other legal reasons the NIF doesn't try and retrospectively apply to previous conduct and it, it wouldn't really be able to even if it tried there's a whole, whole range of legal issues arising but what that means is if you combine today's circumstances where people who have not historically reported allegations either at all or for a long period of time are now um, having the space and ability because of changes, fundamental changes to society to report things even a significant period of time down the track. So what that means is you can, as an SSO, have situations where you're getting a report of conduct that might have occurred in 2016 uh, and that might be of conduct that is dealing with a respondent who's still within your sport still holds particular roles important roles within your sport that uh, is absolutely actionable because it's of uh, very serious allegations for instance um, to the extent that you might be running into the territory of broader negligence if you didn't do anything to investigate those types of issues. So that's the, that's the ballpark you're playing in. But the NIF uh, doesn't and doesn't try to apply to that conduct. So it's becoming really important for sports to have a catalogue of what policies applied from what periods because uh, it's then very easy to pull out the uh, list and work out what applied at what point. So on X date, this fell within the period where our last Sports Commission MPP applied. So we'll go to that document and we'll, we'll use that document. So that's, that's really important because these are generally going to be issues that a sport can't sit on their hands and do nothing for. Um, so it's going to be critical to easily get your hands on that policy to then apply it. And we've seen NSOs and SSOs a number of times in the past 18 months have to go through that exact process of determining the relevant historical policy and applying it in the same manner that they would have. So, if we're talking about the role of the board and committee and directors in this process, obviously one of the overarching obligations of uh, any board, um, but particularly for sport organisations, is ensuring the proper governance framework is not only in place but complied with. So sport has a lot of policies. Um, there's a lot out there, but these are only going, these integrity policies are only going to gain importance over time. So there's definitely legal risk, uh, reputational risk, commercial risk, a whole range of other risks arising if boards don't sufficiently ensure that the relevant framework is in place and complied with. Uh, fallout from major incidents is a critical one that will generally get escalated to the board at the SSO level. Uh, particularly even for larger SSOs, uh, fallout in the sense that there's generally going to be media attention even if matters are dealt with in a proper manner. Uh, so it's becoming more and more important for sports, even smaller sports, to have comms plans in place uh, to know what to do if they were going to be front page of tomorrow's Age or Herald Sun. What's the process? Even things uh, down to as simple as who's the director on the board, who would be the designated spokesperson? Is that going to be the president? Is that going to be the vice president? Is there someone with PR background on there that uh, would be the relevant person? Um, but that would be a good start. And then having some simple processes in place to determine the sports approach to dealing with the media uh, and also ensuring that the sport is across the detail of what's occurred, what processes are in place and what is going to happen moving forward.
So as an SSO, you're obviously the the guardian in essence of your whole range of clubs, associations, and the the key uh, sort of conduit between them and the NSO. And you're the one facing the the grassroots level and dealing with those matters. So there's a critical point of ensuring both compliance and capability at those lower levels because that's fundamentally where all the participant population sits and so that's generally where most of the issues are going to arise so uh, taking the necessary steps to ensure that your uh, whatever members you have whether it's clubs or associations or both uh, have these policies uh, as you would know with any sort of policy matter for a sport it's one thing to, for them to actually have adopted it but it's another for them to broadly be aware that it's in place and at least some high level information of how it applies. So using your existing processes and channels and thinking of sort of new and innovative ways to get the information across to the, the key people is always critical. Uh, and then as individual directors rather than as a collective, uh, there is sort of some responsibility and you're beholden to at least understand the basics of this area and processes, and particularly for sports where there's no staff, uh, it's going to have a higher level of importance. Um, and also to ask questions. So if you're thinking uh, director's duties, fiduciary obligations, uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with, and you're generally going to be obliged to ask questions about how things operate, particularly if you have got staff who manage those processes and policies uh, it's not something you can set and forget and not involve yourself in at least at a high level and you you would be certainly running into potential director duty issues if you uh, simply didn't deal with that at all and then education obviously is a, a critical one because the the best policy is uh, not very if any effective uh, if it sits in a drawer and no one knows about it. So particularly if we think about the subject matter dealt with by these policies, we think about contemporary society and where it's moving. Generally, these are to ensure that everyone enjoys and is safely participating in sport and maximises their opportunities and enjoyment of um, what's supposed to be, particularly at the grass, grassroots level, a, a public benefit, a public societal health and um, well-being good so uh, it's sort of inherent to ensure that there's continuous upskilling of the organizations within the sport um, to maintain that purpose and unlike for other things where that you can sort of argue there's box ticking and it's uh, compliance for compliance sake certainly in these areas you're looking at sort of real world issues where people who experience breaches of these policies, are, they're the ones that potentially will will not come back to your sport again for, for the rest of their life and, and others as well. So um, it is something that's really worth uh, ensuring is adopted and applied correctly because it's sort of for the betterment of the, the sporting ecosystem in general. Uh, so some takeaways from today's session and cognizant of wanting to leave as much time for questions as possible because uh, I'm sure there's probably some uh, specific scenarios that sports may have had or questions about that so uh, something from for again the slides for you to take away uh, and I've left my contact details in there as well so uh, for anyone attending here in person or online feel free to uh, just give me a call or drop me an email if you want to just have a general chat about uh, any of these types of matters, um, just from a higher level perspective or more specifically. Uh, but now, more than happy to open to the floor for questions for the remainder. <laughs> uh, I, I used all my loyally skills to uh, convince the 18 year old working at the front desk to let me go out when it was clearly too windy to, to go out. And I'm getting old and don't have any skill anymore, I think. 
Um, mine's not necessarily a question, but um, probably just more a statement. So I was recently with a couple of people in this room, did the SIA um, course for three days. And it was, if you ever get the opportunity, it's fantastic. Um, certainly learnt a lot, got a lot of resources out of it. I guess one of the takeaways from it was they are very keen for you to reach out to them and they are very keen to do education. So if you are wanting their help, um, I would certainly encourage you to reach out to them. Um, I know you spoke about the timelines um, that CIA have when they do have a complaint and obviously some can take a length of time. Is this feedback that you or us as sports give them back? Is there anything being done about that? Because there becomes a real challenge for us. We manage individuals, we manage emotions. Um, so is are we providing feedback to CIA about how do they get better with the process and, and what it is? Obviously, I was at that same course and I provided the feedback directly to them, but is there something we more can leverage as a cohort to ensure that they do it? I know, speaking to other organisations within my sport, Queensland and New South Wales, they have exactly the same issue, but it just seems to be falling on deaf ears. Um, and the challenge we have is we're managing expectations of individuals and CIA don't see that because they don't have to deal with the individual when we do. Yeah, and so that's the critical challenge. The even for the matters that CIA has jurisdiction for, the sport is the face of the matter, and the individuals involved are going to come to the sport. They're not going to go to CIA. So that's that's the cold hard reality. Uh, it, it is absolutely incumbent on sport organisations to be continually providing that feedback because, as with all things particularly government related, they, they have to hear things a lot for there to be the potential for change. And uh, it's definitely something that, it, that it's worth going through your NSO as well, because they have a much greater line into CR, sort of noting its federal jurisdiction and targeted um, bodies. So it's absolutely worth doing that. There's been, I think, clearly with any new organisation and new policy framework, there's going to be teething issues along the way and working through the resourcing needs and the case categorisation of just exactly how many complaints were they going to get when they started this brand new framework and how many of them can be dealt with very easily at lower levels versus dealing being dealt with by CIA or the NSO. So, it's genuinely taken them some time to work through all those issues because, again, they don't know what they don't know. And it's a bit of a uh, catch-22 where once they created an independent body with a hotline that people can go to, that generates a lot more complaints being lodged with the independent body. That's also a reality. So, And they there was no real way of knowing exactly how many, what level of... Um, complaint they were going to get until they they saw it but yeah it's it's something incumbent on sports because there's no point sitting on your hands and having to deal with those key stakeholders which are your, your individuals um, without passing on that feedback as with all things whether whether it makes change is is another matter um, but it's probably also one to be cognizant of when you're trying to upfront manage expectations of people and not to avoid to the extent possible giving unrealistic timelines or expectations of when things are going to be dealt with um, because whilst it's going to be problematic either way if it drags on it's going to be the most problematic if there's a, a proposed timeline that's sort of significantly breached at the start. Um, I was have a question, I suppose, in regards to the an external investigation process, I suppose, under the CDD, CDDP, whether that's managed by CIA or um, it's referred to an external body, I guess, by virtue of the, the sport um, to investigate. If part of that investigation process, um, I suppose, concludes whether the um, whether the complaint of the behaviour is substantiated or unsubstantiated and provides a recommended sanction uh, with reference to the case categorization model and then provides that back to the sport. 
if the sport then has to also refer to this or refer to the same case, case categorization model, at what point do the aggravating factors such as previous investigations or complaints um, or reports even um, be shared with the external body um, through the federated model? So I suppose, yeah, if you were going to, I suppose to reference potentially patterns of behaviour, is that then information um, that is shared with the investigation managing the complaint currently on hand? Or is that something that the sport then considers when making their decision post the investigation? Yeah, good question. It's certainly something that uh, can be and should be taken into account. So <clears throat> separately to the case categorisation, which just deals with the single incident or incidents that are being investigated, when you move to sanction the, the NIF policy itself, the CDDP lists a range of factors that you also take into account when uh, determining the sanction and prior conduct, prior um, unrelated conduct to that incident is absolutely a listed factor. So it's something that the sport can take into account and should take into account. The question of whether that information is shared or not is the more problematic issue um, because it's probably not going to be shared as a matter of course. Uh, so particularly for intra-sport sharing, it's something that's probably really critical to in when you if you're an SSO and you're managing a complaint and you either get it back from SEA or you get to the point of sanctioning, that's absolutely a point where you should be uh, liaising with the NSO. It, it's becoming easier as more sport bodies as a whole, sport federated bodies as a whole, uh, adopt sort of integrated CRM or a database that has flagging systems which, which show history of individuals and previous breaches, but um, certainly not all sports have that. Um, so it, it's always beneficial to have sort of standardised information sharing processes that people can use when this happens. Uh, it's just about working out what, what works best for the sport. Um, and I think you, you would have to, it would be worth reaching out to SIA and getting their exact comment on do they, as a matter of course, share information around prior breaches for a particular respondent that they're dealing with now? I think the, the problem will be they, they have information around the matters that they have jurisdiction for, um, which doesn't cover everything. Um, but I think whilst not knowing off the top of my head, I'd be um, concerned that they may not provide that information as a matter of course, or even if you ask it due to Sort of confidentiality and other reasons so it's something absolutely worth asking them and um, if they say they can't providing feedback on that point as well a uh, quick question for me perhaps someone i'll come to you kate now, interesting in the papers recently a matter of international um, a, a coach being sanctioned internationally in the us and then sia have now appointed investigators uh, locally um, to look at those and then historical matters relating to incidents in other states, not Victoria. Perhaps just a bit of an overview of some, you know, some of the complications of that. Yeah, it's, it goes. So the first point is it goes to, uh, I guess we operate, sports are private organisations, so they're not, they're not government. Uh, and therefore, there can be great challenges in sharing intelligence and information, even amongst Australian sporting bodies, let alone when you get overseas jurisdictions involved. And one of the biggest problems that sports face and have historically faced is lack of information sharing about people who have had findings against them and the ability of those individuals to then uh, pop up in other sports without that knowledge, uh, without that sports uh, knowledge of the, the prior incidents. So, there's probably a couple of relevant points to make about that. Uh, depending on which policy you're looking at, uh, so the NIF, uh, off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure it has this clause where it essentially has a sort of mutual recognition of penalties clause where it sort of talks about if there's a finding made of a quasi-tribunal or relevant regulatory body that would otherwise breach the NIF, in that type of circumstance, then 
it can be taken as a breach of the NIF without having to go through the process. So it's essentially like a mutual recognition of sanction type clause. So that would be the first point where there's the possibility that you can recognise other sanctions that have occurred in the sporting environment. It's not something where uh, purely because that was a US uh, regulatory body that imposed that sanction, you're stuck in Australia and you can't do anything about it. So that's probably the first point. Um, the second point is it it is a really common scenario in our federated model where something will happen in a particular state jurisdiction and then someone a respondent will move and then there's a lack of information sharing even between member associations within the same sport let alone different sports so that's where uh, individual sports that are federated it's sort of incumbent upon them to have some form of process in place to ensure that penalties and particularly serious sanctions are distributed to the relevant bodies uh, so they're aware of it and having sort of tightly controlled procedures about that because there is some legal defamation risk that can apply and it's not something that we would ever recommend that a sport necessarily broadcast to the world but for those uh, organisations that aren't within a national database that has flagging systems and the like it's a really critical point to consider because uh, organisations can't action matters unless they're they're aware of them fundamentally and uh, it's it's a real weakness of the sporting ecosystem it's very hard to overcome but uh, something that probably needs to be worked on thank you um, i'm just wanting to follow up the question of the what seems to me to be an inconsistency between what we've got as the procedures that we've got to follow in our constitution and the procedures that are laid down for us to follow in our NSO's complaints and disciplinary policy. The complaints and disciplinary policy that the NSO's put through is all about procedure. It's about using a tribunal, having a complaints manager, having a, a decision maker, a whole lot of processes for dealing with complaints. It says this can be adopted all the way down the organisation unchanged, it says in the preamble. But the procedures that we've specified in our constitution are quite different. Um, we don't have the a lot of the preliminary negotiation and discussion with the decision maker, with the complaints manager, we don't have a decision maker. And when we have a tribunal, it's a three member tribunal, which is basically within the sport. And they have a three member tribunal, which is basically not within the sport. So they're not they're not um, really aligned. So we thought, well, we're governed by the um, NSO. We should be referring to their policy and not to ours, which is in our constitution. How can we have these two in parallel, which appear to be so different for dealing with the same matter? Yeah, it's, good. it's a really good question. It touches on that point that I mentioned earlier where the constitutional clause will generally not be an exhaustive clause. So whether it's been used that way in the past or not, it, it may have been essentially used as a catch-all and everything goes through that mechanism. But the way they're drafted, it's not actually the case that technically you have to do that. So the first point would be you need to really clearly delineate if your NSO has adopted the conduct and disciplinary policy, what is that purported to apply to? What types of breaches? What's its scope? And then you need to then sort of, if you as an SSO are bound by that policy, then essentially if you've, if you've um, bought into that, then the scope of that conduct and disciplinary policy applies to any non-NIF breaches uh, that you essentially are prosecuting at the SSO level. And that simply because you are using the conduct and disciplinary policy for a matter that's within scope for that policy uh, doesn't mean that you're somehow breaching your constitution because it's non-exhaustive and it can simply sit there and apply sort of at your discretion for matters that don't fall within the scope of that policy 
or any other scenarios sort of on an ad hoc basis. So it's not the the way those constitutional clauses are drafted are not um, this applies to everything. So it does allow you scope to have uh, other policies that are, apply. And certainly we wouldn't, for that reason, we wouldn't recommend SSOs ever sort of amend their constitution to refer to uh, NSO policies, for instance, because they change over time. You don't want to bake in a particular static reference to an NSO's policy at a given date in the constitution that might change in future and you have an outdated reference in your document that has to have member approval for changes. So um, we, we certainly are very comfortable with SSOs retaining their general uh, disciplinary clause in the constitution and then it becomes a practical matter of working out the scope of the NSO conduct and this disciplinary policy what matters at your level does it apply to and then working from there what's in scope what's out of scope follow-up question so just following up from that it looks to me as if almost everything that we might possibly deal with is covered by one or other of the the um, NSO policies. We had envisaged putting into our constitution a clause that said we were subject to the not specific policies of the NSO, but the constitution and policies of the NSO as modified from time to time. So that doesn't bind us into something we have to change. Is that OK or would that be going too far? because we understand that's what's required of us by the fact of being affiliated. Yes, yeah, so that's a that's a separate question. And putting my advising an SSO hat on, unless there was pressure from the NSO, then we would never recommend an SSO go out of its way to, in its own constitution, uh, restrict its powers in any way or specifically uh, specify that it's subject to XYZ of the NSO. So as an SSO, you will most likely be a member of the NSO. So under the NSO constitution, you're a member and there's some obligations that will undoubtedly apply to you under the NSO constitution, under that contract. But unless there was an explicit requirement for you to do certain things in your constitution, and generally speaking, there's not, and even if there was, unless you were getting pushed by the NSO, I would again hazard uh, to say there's no need for you as a separate legal entity uh, to be somehow restricting your own board powers, for instance, or any other powers of the organisation within your own document, which primarily governs the relationship between you as an SSO and your members, as opposed to you and the NSO, which is at the NSO constitution level. Follow up, follow up question. Um, so the example, if I get it, so if the constitution said the tribunal must be made up of three directors um, and the, NS, the, the higher body policy said the, the um, tribunal must not be made up of any directors using the word must, then that would be something that would be potentially significant. Uh, not, not determinatively that type of narrow requirement because you've got to take a step back and work out what that tribunal clause in the constitution applies to as opposed to the whether the mandatory composition of a tribunal applies. So, yeah, so, it, yeah, you take take the step back. If it's still a non-exhaustive clause as to when that tribunal as a whole applies, then not problematic. But taking your type of mandatory language, if the clause said any and all disciplinary conduct and any other similar matter related or directly or indirectly to the SSO must be dealt with under this clause, then that's when you'd have a problem. For the questions, I think 
Simon and there's nothing further on the chat. So uh, with that, we'll pass over to Lisa to wrap up for us. Um, can we please have a round of applause for Simon? Fantastic, Simon. That was awesome coverage again and great examples. And every time I kind of go to talk about integrity, there's all, always bits of confusion that come up and different things that are, are at play, and that just helped us cement the current rules. And thank you to you. Thank you to Landers for providing this fantastic facility, and thank you to Sport and Rec Victoria for supporting us in in presenting this session. Um, and there will be follow-up sessions. And as Simon said, if there's questions... Um, queries, worries, please follow up with either us at Vic Sport with Simon and the Landers team and so that you can just navigate these issues carefully, um, slowly and carefully and with confidence rather than, um, you know, having a, a huge stress about it because it is a really stressful situation, some of the things that come across our desks um, and we need help from time to time, so please reach out. But thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you to everyone online for dialing in um, and have a fantastic long weekend. King's birthday, I'm getting used to saying that. Um, enjoy and hopefully we will see some of you at the Victorian Sport Awards next Wednesday evening. So enjoy. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, we're on the